I'd be really interested to hear about your digital asset strategy sure. because I think you folks are one of the more forward-looking uh, banks uh, and institutions that we've worked with. And so, you know, what do you think that'll deliver for you and, and how do you see that going for the capital markets industry? Yeah, well, thank you, Sergey, and thank you all for turning up today. Um, look, this is, this is kind of the, the pinnacle of our achievement so far, but it's a journey of two years. Uh, we set up a digital asset uh, services team at ANZ uh, two years ago. Uh, very small team, but very highly skilled. And we took a view that um, we wanted to prosecute transactions in the, in the DVP world rather than P PVP. The first readings and signals we took were from decentralized finance and the way in which that interacted with a, a totally radical operating model on a, on a very well known and understood business model, buying, selling, borrowing, and lending. And so we understood that business model aspect of it, the operating model was radically different. So, um, and, and also in most countries, including Australia, um, there weren't payments problems to be solved. Uh, we had real time payments, the settlement in 15 seconds, so we didn't really have an issue. And we wanted to solve real world problems for our customers, hence our focus on DVP. Uh, and so over the course of the last two years, we've initially minted our uh, $8 DC stablecoin. We issued that on the Ethereum mainnet, uh, deliberately on public permission list because that's where the standards were being created. Uh, we created ERC20 uh, tokens. The token you've seen there is an 1155 token, uh, which is much more flexible for the asset class in nature based, uh, which we're very pleased with. Um, but really, um, we wanted to uh, increase the sophistication of our DVP problem solving by getting to this point where we're doing cross currency, uh, where we were using our own FX API integrated with uh, the transaction flow, but also uh, the cross chain interoperability protocol that Sergey and his team have provided has really knitted everything together so seamlessly. And this, this idea, as you said earlier, right, the value and the message moving together is revolutionary. It's going from a, a sequential world of messages, then value transfer in domestic markets to one of cross-chain message and asset transfer. And that's, that's a real breakthrough. So we've just quietly, we've, we've, we've just um, created um, our own digital asset portal so our customers can access and send instructions. We've got a tokenization engine which has been built by our technology team. We've also got a smart contract uh, building capability and we've got marketplace contracts that we built ourselves. Um, and we've got wallet infrastructure from Fireblocks that we give to our customers to facilitate these transactions. And uh, as I said, we've integrated a number of our commercial APIs into the transaction flow as well. So that's really where we're at. So Sergey, what do you think about this connectivity between existing bank infrastructure and the, the real world, the, the new world of uh, blockchains where digital assets are going to be born natively? And what do you think that kind of role that you, you've been playing with uh, Chainlink is going to deliver to the market? So I, I think it's actually all very complementary, frankly. Um, when I look at Swift, um, I see a private key signing infrastructure that everyone already uses. So I see a well-integrated, very secure system for signing transactions. And I see a lot of infrastructure that banks have that are very security sensitive and very thoughtful about how they provide security. And that infrastructure can be used to enable blockchain transactions. The, the piece that's missing, firstly, is the ability to efficiently integrate with the super fragmented world of blockchain technology, which is only becoming more fragmented and it will only be more fragmented. The world uh, that was previously uh, espoused by our industry was you would have a single global ledger, and that ch technically became impossible. So nobody can seem to create a single global ledger, whether it's in a private context or a public context, it's never gonna be a, a single global ledger, at least not in the next uh, three to five years. You know, We'll see how technology evolves, but we'll see where we go. So everyone is gonna be sitting on their own chain, just like everyone sits on their own database, and you're going to need to integrate with those chains. And then the next problem after you, you integrate into the chains is getting the chains to transact with each other. Because if you don't transact with other chains, you'll be stuck in your own chain, which is like stuck being stuck in your own market or your, with your existing client base. So just there won't be anyone else who can buy your assets or sell you anything. You, you've, there's like no point of doing it, basically, because the whole point is this globally connected globalized um, you know, model of doing transactions. And then there's a lot of uh, technologies that, that we make that can help facilitate that, providing identity data, providing market data, providing all the different data that needs to enrich the asset. And then the, the legal questions, uh, which have been traditionally the hurdle, are now being resolved. 
And so the, their resolution, I think, will only accelerate the rate at which people do these transactions because I am already seeing banks doing production transactions for real world value on chain. And those production transactions seem to have very large demand from a larger amount of counterparties than their traditional transactions. But, you know, Nigel, you're, you're there in the, in the market every day dealing with all this. So excited to hear what you think about connectivity and, and also just the market. Yeah, so look, the, the, the fundamental um, premise we have is that we're, we're bringing um, different ledgers together, meaning that asset ledgers have traditionally been on one infrastructure, payment and settlement infrastructure is on different ledgers. And so that's why you have T plus two. You've got an asset transaction, then you wait for the payment, then you wait for the reconciliation, then you get finality, that's two days, right? What we're seeing here is like 10 minutes. So all of the live transactions we've done, we've done in under 10 minutes. Uh, and with atomic settlement in some cases using smart contracts. So it's a profoundly important uplift on your operating model. And then when you think about what SWIFT can do, um, again with Chainlink and linking all those chains together for the asset markets of the future, you're solving the access problem. How do I get to, how do I access, do I need to build something new? Well actually no, you don't need to build anything new. You've got your SWIFT gateways, you've got your messaging standards, you can use those to send instructions. And then you've got the liquidity um, uh, problem, which um, at scale could be quite, well, it could be debilitating for, for asset markets to have fragmented liquidity. So you solve the liquidity problem, you reduce liquidity anxiety, and you give yourself a genuine chance of leveraging all the benefits of the operating model uplift that you get from this type of technology. So that to me is really the, the punchline here, Sergey. Yeah, makes sense. Uh, I, th I think as we work with more and more folks, this becomes clearer and clearer to them. And as they transact with counterparties, I think these realizations will just become clearer and clearer to everybody. Yeah. Um, you know, we, we did all this work with Swift and you folks were part of that. Yeah. And that was work that it took us um, about five years worth of back and forth to, to get going and get into the right place and finally conclude and have a report about, which, you know, all you folks are welcome to look at and read available at our booth. But I... I really would um, like to hear what you saw there, and you know what it, what realizations came came to you from 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 that work. Well, as I say, I think it's it, it's really about the um, the setting up expectations that the the problems of tomorrow being solved today, right? As, as I say, it's it's access, it's liquidity. What's the investment profile I need to make? Uh, and then for us, uh, we've been on a path of learning. Uh, a path of test and learn particularly. We've done a lot of live transactions with customers on public chains. Uh, and so when we get to this stage uh, of this kind of transaction, we are using all the capability that we've, we've built. We're using, uh, we didn't use Swift for this one, but we are using uh, a, a business model we understand well, but with a radically new operating model. And I think, as I say, come back to this message with value um, for example, we're talking to the superannuation industry in Australia, the pension fund industry, where a contribution from an employer on behalf of the employee to the fund, to investment, can take 15 days. 15 days, right? And so we think we can send instructions and give context to the value from the employer on behalf of the employee to the fund and then the fund to their investors and to the tax office to take their cut. Um, all done with CCIP intermediating a lot of that. And to your point earlier, right, updating the state, right, the NAV, uh, what is the state, what's the price, all of that information can flow and give context to the transaction. So I think it's revolutionary, I really do. Um, a lot of work ahead of us, uh, but there's some very interesting use cases where friction is significant in, in the fund management industry and in nature-based assets, um, which is kind of an open field, a green field, no pun intended. Um, but really, that's an area where we think there's very low incumbency and very antiquated financial market infrastructure. Great, yeah, I think that's, that's a very thoughtful point of view. And as I said, I think you folks are on the cutting edge of, of what I've seen in the industry uh, today. Um, I think it would be interesting to hear about the reef credit yeah. tokenization that you folks worked on. You know, that's an interesting industry to understand. And I think it's also useful to, to understand, you know, how you did that technically, what you folks learned from that yeah. in more detail and the role of connectivity there. And, and just, you know, you, you just mentioned that it's a nascent market with a lot of opportunity. So yes. I, I think everyone would be thrilled to just hear yeah. what, what's there. Well, I mean, the Reef Credit is a, is a uniquely Australian uh, uh, 
uh, nature-based asset um, addressing needs of the Great Barrier Reef, uh, of course, uh, hopefully, hopefully most of you know what that is, uh, the largest reef on the planet, and it is getting um, bleached and also uh, impacted by nitrogen, which runs off of farms because a fertilizer in Queensland uh, is used for farming and land management. So the reef credit is an incentive, a financial incentive for farmers and land managers to change their practices, reduce the amount of nitrogen, uh, reduce the amount of uh, runoff uh, from their properties that eventually find their way into the, into the ocean and impact the reef. So that financial incentive is supported by the Queensland government um, and they run the registry. So what we've done is taken the, the, the credits that are being produced by the the, the folks that are doing much better work around their land management, uh, that goes onto a registry. And we can take the credentials of the project and put it on the token, right? And so in that way, you're actually differentiating the tokens to the extent you're actually cr creating an NFT as well. So we use a different standard uh, to create that NFT because the credentials of the project give the buyer the, the, the look through right to where the, the land management practices are occurring. Same with carbon, we can do the same with carbon credits as well. So then you take that and you put it on a blockchain and say, we have a token for sale. And then we have, uh, on the buy side, we've got um, one of our customers, uh, Grollo Carbon Ventures, wanted to experiment with improved operating models for acquiring nature-based assets. So uh, they bought, um, and not in this case, but they bought carbon office in the same way. We tokenized carbon and they, uh, they purchased that on-chain with our $8 DC. With this, we haven't re revealed the customers yet. Um, that'll be soon in some press we're gonna be doing, but um, same story. We have customers who want to own these credits. This is not an offsetting credit, but it's one where the, the, the company involved, when you hear about it, you'll see, ah, that makes sense for their kind of corporate brand and the way they wanna do business. They're, very, uh, they're a retail brand with a lot of association with the C, uh, and they wanted to have the ability to um, project their green credentials, but also give their customers these credits. The great thing about tokens, as you know, Sergey, you can fractionalize them right down to tiny amounts. So the idea that a brand could purchase tokenized reef credits and say, you buy a pair of our some of our goods uh, and we'll give you some reef credits. And then as a bank, we're saying, well, you know, we think that not too far away, that digital wallet's gonna be the stable mate for bank accounts, right? So we wanna facilitate that capability so that when we do have customers who want to either give or gift or trade with nature-based assets that we've tokenized, they can hold them as offset to retire or they can give them to their customers. This is a whole bunch of use cases that can explode from there. Yeah, that's, that's fascinating. Um, I think I heard two, two pretty unique things there just to show once again how cutting edge you guys are and thinking ahead in my opinion. So one thing is the fractional nature yeah. of tokenized assets and how, how low that can go in impacting the consumer yeah and how shareable that is, right. all the way down to the, even the average consumer. So that's a very interesting aspect of tokenized assets that I, that I feel is underexplored. Yeah. And uh, because many people are still at the stage of what is a tokenized asset or let's make a blockchain or something. But I think that, that offering that type of value could be quite interesting. Yes. And then the other thing is that, I, that you mentioned that's quite interesting is uh, also that the record being updated was important. So it wasn't just creating the record it was also keeping it updated that, that made the record useful and valuable in, in the system that you folks um, put together. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I, I guess just another quick question is for, for green finance, you know, what do you think tokenization offers generally? And you know, why do you think it's an asset class that's more likely to be tokenized? Because yeah. beyond being a leader in, in blockchain technology, I do also see you folks taking a real leadership position, green finance and yes. those things. So why do you think that blockchains and tokenization have a, have a role to play in that industry generally? Yeah, well, again, it's very complementary with our sustainable finance strategy, firstly and foremost. But secondly, it, it allows a, a substantial uplift to the operating model of green finance, particularly credits, carbon credits and offsets today, which are basically still, at least in Australia, still traded on the phone over the counter. Uh, so it really is, you know, it's decades old technology. It's slow. It's T plus three at best. Uh, and it's really clunky. So the, the ability to like leapfrog straight to the most contemporary type of financial market infrastructure for uh, an asset class we care deeply about uh, that we have invested in um, is, is really exciting for us. So if we can get the industry with our marketplace contracts and our commodities environmental finance teams working on marketplace uh, creation around credits that our customers want to buy to offset or to use for retail purposes, then we want to facilitate that and take them through that journey. 
uh, and give them the most contemporary, the most secure, the fastest, cheapest, hopefully, uh, and the most sustainable uh, way of doing business for them and their customers. What about you? What do you think is going to happen in the, in the future? Of, I mean, you've talked a big story today. I think it's something we've definitely bought into. But what do you think five to ten years from now, what a digital asset market is going to be looking like uh, for this audience? I mean, it's pretty, it's pretty simple for me. Um, every bank's going to have its own chain. Every bank's going to have its own stable coin. And every bank is going to have hundreds of real world assets that they take from the real world and they package yeah. into token as tokenized blockchain things. You know, there was this word uh, securitization. Yeah. Securitization is not a popular word anymore. Um, but the logic of securitization makes a lot of sense, right? People want exposure to other assets, to cash flows, to other categories of economic activity that they can't get access to, period. Um, and they want that purchase easily purchasable, easily holdable, easily transferable, and in deeply liquid markets where they can resell it easily. And so that's really what I think banks will be able to do is not only um, make stable coins, but you guys are like the real world asset tokenization wizards. That's what you do. Like you guys did that a little bit too much at a certain point, but the skills to do that um, are the greatest they've ever been in your industry. And now there's gonna be a huge demand for tokenized real world assets that are legitimate and legally backed and properly um, formed the, the, the thing that we're trying to solve is, or working on solving pretty actively now and doing successfully in some cases, is what are the technical challenges to creating those assets, moving those assets, making sure those assets have liquidity. And uh, I think the banks that take the first steps to create those assets will be very successful. Just like the first banks that had a big role to play with digitized market data, and the first banks that had a role to play in the internet all became more successful. I think it's another one of those opportunities. Um, and so I think ANZ is gonna be very successful. Well, thank you. We hope so too. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, Great working with you. Thank you very much.